Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours. This is your Monday Minutes. And today I thought I'd take a angle on the BLS side of things, um, the, especially when it comes to something like a uh, chest pain patient, a patient having a potential heart attack. And as a BLS provider, what it is that you should be thinking, even from the ALS point of view, what you should be maybe expecting your BLS counterparts to be doing for the patient prior to your arrival. Now, of course, the big thing for heart attacks is time, right? It's, uh, you hear it often, time is muscle. Um, and you don't want to be waiting around for paramedics to get there or for the patient to be uh, taking aspirin or whatever the case may be while you're waiting for the paramedics or delaying transport for that, okay, for that a aspirin administration or whatever, whatever it is the patient might want to do or what you can do. Start getting to the ambulance, guys, especially if the transport time to the hospital is closer than the time for a paramedic unit to get to you. We'll talk a little bit about, a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes, but what are we doing as, as EMTs, right? The main thing, of course, is the patient's airway, monitoring their airway. Is it patent? Is it open? Consider giving them oxygen depending upon your guidelines. What do your guidelines say? Is it a non-rebreather at 10 to 15 liters per minute? Is it a nasal cannula at 6 liters per minute? A lot of patients that might be having a uh, NMI might be feeling short of breath and putting a non-rebreather on them they might not be able to tolerate that. They might feel very uh, uh, claustrophobic having the oxygen mask on. Keep that in mind, okay? And check their breathing. Monitor it for adequacy, okay? Are they breathing uh, well enough? Are they getting enough oxygen, okay? Try to help them control their breathing if you feel they're hyperventilating from the anxiety of, of feeling like they, they've, they're having a heart attack, okay? And again, about ALS, right? Um, request the advanced life support, of course, if you have a patient you're suspecting that's having a, a heart attack, but don't delay the transport, okay? Try to limit the patient's activity. Too many times, I'm going to be honest with you guys, I see providers out there who will suspect a patient's having a heart attack and request ALS, treat it very seriously, but then have the patient walk downstairs or upstairs or to an ambulance. Try to limit that act, that activity, guys. Don't put more stress on the patient's heart than it has to be, okay? Don't increase their efforts of breathing more than it has to be. And try to put the patient in a position of comfort. Many patients, the best position is going to be, you know, sort of a, a semi phallus sort of position where they're sitting up, okay? They're not going to want to lay down most of the time. They're going to want to have sort of that, that sort of incline position, okay? And can you treat it? As EMTs, guys, nowadays, EMTs more and more in their guidelines are able to treat um, a, a chest pain complaint. Now, it's going to, of course, depend upon your local guidelines, what you're allowed to do, okay? Many times it goes by the patient's age, the patient's history, okay? Um, and aspirin is a, one of your first choices, right? But think about it. Most patients, you're looking at patients, let's say, 33 or 35 years age, years of age or older, um, or even a patient who has a history, right? They've got a cardiac history, okay? Consider giving that aspirin. Usually, you can give them two tubal aspirins, uh, 162 milligrams. Some uh, guidelines might want to give let you give up to uh, three or four baby aspirin, okay, uh, the tubal aspirins, okay? Um, it's going to depend upon your guidelines. Um, common guidelines are the 162 by mouth tubal aspirins, okay? But keep in mind, make sure the patient doesn't have an allergy or a, a hypersensitivity to aspirin, okay? Being on Coumadin is not a, an allergy. Just keep that in mind, okay? Now, nitroglycerin. A lot of times, nitroglycerin can help a patient having EMI. Got to watch out for the blood pressure. The EMTs, you don't have the luxury of being able to start an intravenous and give a patient fluid if their blood pressure bottoms out from giving them a nitroglycerin. But if it does, keep in mind, you can raise, lay them down, raise their legs up, okay? There's things you can do as an EMT uh, you know, provider to be able to help the patient if their blood pressure drops after giving the nitroglycerin.
Now, if you're requesting advanced life support, um, you know, and start transporting like I mentioned, guys. But if you gave the aspirin, there's no real improvement. The patient's not really saying that they're improved. Consider giving them nitroglycerin. But most guidelines will tell you, you want to give that only if the patient is already prescribed the nitroglycerin. The, the nitro is prescribed to that patient. Okay, so go ahead, give them the one tab, one spray, depending upon what they have, okay, under their tongue, all right? But keep in mind, you don't want to do that if the patient's blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is below 120. Some guidelines might say 110. It depends. Follow your guidelines, but on average, you're seeing 120 systolic BP in order to give them their own uh, nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin tab or nitroglycerin spray. Keep in mind, you've got these erectile dysfunction drugs out there. Many times, if the patient has taken an erectile dysfunction drug, Cialis, Viagra, things like that, within 72 hours, you don't want to give them nitroglycerin. If you have a luxury, you can call medical control and ask them if you can give the nitro if the patient took a erectile dysfunction drug. And depending upon the patient's blood pressure and how they're presenting, that's going to depend upon whether or not the doc might let you go ahead and give that that drug, okay? Guys, ba these are basic guidelines, very popular protocols. I just want you to think about this as an ENT provider of what you're doing. And, and when you're doing these things, guys, the aspirin, the nitroglycerin, think about moving the patient, getting the patient going, getting them to the ambulance while you're waiting for ALS, while this aspirin is taking effect, while the nitroglycerin is taking effect, okay? get the patient going. Now, the one thing I want to mention, guys, is when you're waiting for ALS, if the ALS crew is fairly close, they're going to be there in a few minutes, do things to help the paramedics be able to swing into action when they get there, okay? Getting good vital signs, getting a good history, okay? Past medical history, what the patient drugs, what medications the patients are on, okay? This type of stuff is going to help the paramedics when they get there. A simple thing you can do on top of getting your sample history is getting the OPQRS history. Now, if you know what that means, I'm just going to go over it real quick for you because these are the things you can tell the paramedics that will help them. Okay, They might do it again themselves, but you being able to provide this basic information might really help them uh, when they get on scene to go ahead and start giving patient treatment, especially if it appears to be a genuine MI going on. Okay, so onset. What was the patient doing when, when these signs and symptoms started, guys, right? What was the onset? Was it sudden or was it gradual? Okay, basic stuff. Provoking it, okay? Is there anything that the patient does that makes these chest pain symptoms better or worse? Breathing in, breathing out, moving, stretching, uh, touching it, okay? What about quality? Ask the patient what is it that they're feeling, all right? Is the pain dull? Is it sharp? Is it uh, aching, tearing, crushing, throbbing, or classic chest pain type pain where it feels like somebody is sitting an elephant on their chest, right? They feel a pressure type of a quality. And what about radiation or the region of the pain? Okay, where is it located? Does it go anywhere? To the shoulder, to the back, down one, one arm or the other arm, into the patient's jaw. And the severity. How severe is the symptoms? And you want to talk about on, on terms of 1 to 10. I'm sure you've heard this before. Ask the patient on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst. How bad is this pain? How bad is this breathing? Okay, and the time. When did all of this start? What time did it first occur? Sort of similar to the onset, but this is more specific. You want to know the time of when it it first occurred, okay? In, on onset, what was the patient doing? And in time, when was the patient doing it, okay? So just some quick information here, guys. And again, I'm going to go back to this. Don't forget about the time, guys. Remember, you know, time is of the essence for these patients. Uh, sometimes your paramedic unit might not be that close. You've got to go ahead and start getting them to the ambulance. All right. Sometimes your paramedic unit might not even be available. Start getting to the ambulance, guys. Start getting to the hospital. Worst case scenario, you get there, you've given them the, their own nitroglycerin, you've given them the aspirin, you've given them the oxygen. 
okay? Um, and even best case scenario, you intercept with a paramedic unit on the way to the hospital. And then by having the information we've talked about, the OPQRST, a sample history, and, and uh, you know, what you've done for the patient is going to help the paramedic when they intercept, uh, get that basic information and be able to go ahead and start treating the patient, okay? And don't be insulted. The paramedic starts repeating some of those questions, okay? Um, they sometimes do it to confirm with the patient what's going on. It's not that they don't trust what it is that you're doing. Guys, I hope you can use these Monday minutes. If you have some minutes of your own, be sure to send them over to me. My email is jhoff at emsseo.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode or a suggestion on an episode that you might like to see here on the Monday Minutes. Guys, interested in some more training, especially if you're taking EMS exams and primarily the NREMT exam, go check out the NREMT success course, guys. This is really geared for the sole purpose of you passing the NREMT written or practical exam. There's over six hours of video on how to take the test, how the National Registry works, what you're going to be expected, and what sort of stumbling blocks you might actually encounter when you take your next EMS exam or, again, the National Registry exam. I've just added over 400 paramedic journal questions on this exam, on this, this success course along with the NRE SIM, SIM web app, okay? Those are paramedic level questions, um, but you know what? If you're an EMT, take an National Registry, the videos and that instruction is absolutely going to help you. You can forget about the, 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 the practice questions, focus on the videos, guys. I'm telling you, this will help you if, even if you're an EMT trying to pass the test. All right, guys, that's it for me. Be sure to check me out over at emsofficehours.com. And until next week, as always, Jim Hoffman, stay safe.